We are going to start out talking about polynomials. In fact, really, instead of function behavior, this should be called polynomial behavior. We're going to analyze these to the extent we need to for what this part of the class is about. Um, determine the leading term, the leading coefficient, the degree of the polynomial, then classify the polynomial as constant, linear, quadratic, cubic, or quartic. Piece of cake, right? Well, let's just do it. All right, the leading term, ah, the leading term is the highest degree term, the highest power term. I need to make this bigger, don't I? OK, the leading term is the highest power term. So this is your leading term. Now the leading coefficient, the leading coefficient A coefficient is almost always a number. Well, it is always a number, but sometimes letters A, B, and C, right, are used to stand for numbers. The leading coefficient is the coefficient of the leading term. In this case, it's going to be negative one-third. Because that goes in front of the X squared. Now, classify the polynomial. This is quadratic. Quadratic, highest power two is quadratic. So did I say what it was? Yeah, this, this is the leading term. I'm not sure I actually wrote it down. Leading term. Now we come down here expecting it to be the same kind of problem. And well, the leading term is all the way at the end. We need to write this correctly in order to make it more easy on me, on you. X to the third plus seven X squared minus three X. Now the leading term is X to the third. The leading coefficient I'm going to say coef is an invisible one. And oh, the degree. I didn't write down the degree up here. The degree of this polynomial is two. Highest power is the degree. So 
So the degree here is three. In fact, here, let's be explicit. Okay, and then classify the polynomial. A degree three polynomial is a cubic. So let's see, we've got the leading term. We've got the leading coefficient. Hard to find the leading term if you don't have it written in descending order because this is just what you're taught to look for. Now determine the leading term, leading coefficient, and degree of the polynomial, then classify. All right, so leading term. negative one third, x to the fourth. Leading coefficient, negative one third. Um, degree, Four. Here's the degree. Which means it's a quartic. Degree four is a quartic. Having done that, we are going to find the zeros of functions and their multiplicities. Whew. Okay. So here's a function. I find the zeros of the function by setting f of x equal to zero and solving for x. Notice this is a quartic. Which means it's going to have four uh, zeros. Now, some of them might repeat. Some of them might be complex. They all might be real numbers. We don't know yet. All right, so I'm going to use U substitution because the highest power is two times the middle power. And oh yeah, this is a trinomial. It's a quartic trinomial, but it's, it's, it doesn't happen a lot. But when it does happen, U substitution can make it easier. Substitute. To shun. I have never been able to spell that word well. Okay, u equals x squared, and u squared equals x squared squared, which is x to the fourth. So that lets me substitute u squared minus 11u plus 18 so that so that I temporarily have a quadratic. And then I can either factor it or put it in the quadratic formula. As it is, this is factorable. 
18 equals negative 9 times negative 2 and negative 9 plus negative 2 is negative 11. So that's how I know how to factor this. And I set each factor equal to zero. U minus nine equals zero. U minus two equals zero. Add nine, add nine. Add two, add two. So that I get U equals positive 9 and u equals positive 2. And that's the danger point where you feel like you're through, but you're not. Because we have to solve for x. So you have to go back and find your original substitution there. u is x squared. And u is x squared. And now we're going to solve these by the square root method. The square root of x squared equals plus or minus. Remember that's part of it. The square root of nine and the square root of x squared equals plus or minus the square root of 2. So the square root of x squared is x equals plus or minus. The square root of 9 is 3. And the square root of x squared is x. And, uh, well, square root of 2 is an irrational number and is going to stay the way it is. So the zeros of this function are, um, yeah, order doesn't matter, negative 3, 3, negative the square root of 2, the square root of 2. So that's one of your questions. And now we're going to look at multiplicity. Multiplicity is how many times a solution or, an, or zero happens. <coughs> oh. Negative 3, 3, negative the square root of 2, the square root of 2, multiplicity 1. It only happens once. 3 only happens once. Negative the square root of 2 only happens once. And the square root of 2 only happens once. How exciting. The next one is pretty much the same way. They all have multiplicity one. You're going to have three, three zeros because the highest power is three. And they're each gonna have multiplicity one, I think. Let's find out. Okay, zero equals x to the third minus 3x squared minus x plus 3. I'm going to use grouping on this. 
zero equals x to the third minus three x squared in the first set of parentheses plus parentheses negative one times x plus three. Okay, now you know the drill. We find the GCF in each set of parentheses. X squared. All right, here we have a negative leading term. So I'm going to have to change three into negative three times negative one, so that I can pull out the GCF negative one. Remember, this is something we're forced to do. If the leading term is negative, then your GCF has to be negative. But look at this, our x minus three matches our x minus three. So now, I'm going to have x minus three times the leftovers, because this now is the GCF of the whole equation. Um, I pull out x minus three, and I'm left with x squared minus one. X squared is a perfect square. One is a perfect square. One times one is one. So, x minus three times x plus one times x minus one. That's the factorization, but this is an equation, so we set each factor equal to zero. And so we have x equals positive three, x equals negative one, x equals positive one, and they all occur once. So the multiplicity of each is one. Is it always like that? No. but you might be led to believe that. Um, I need to show you one that's not. So I'm gonna give you a, a, um, a polynomial I've just made up in my brain and I am so nice. You're not going to fall for that, are you? I am so nice that I've already factored it for you. Is that pretty unbelievable? Yeah. Okay, that was a real, I spent hours working on that for you. I hope you're grateful. All right, we're going to find the zeros. So I've got x minus 3 times x minus 3 
times x minus 3 times x minus 3. Yes, I'm doing this the hard way. Times x plus 2 times x plus 2 times x plus 2. See, this was to the fourth power, so it's x minus 3 times x minus 3 times x minus 3 times x minus 3. They repeat four times, and this repeats three times. This repeats two times, x minus 1 times x minus 1 times, finally, x plus 3. And then I set each factor equal to zero. Do I really have to go to this much work? No, you don't, but I chose to. Okay, so we're gonna do the whole little act. X minus three equals zero x minus 3 equals 0, x minus 3 equals 0, x minus 3 equals 0. So what do we get here? We have x equals 3, x equals 3, x equals 3, and x equals 3. So I really didn't need to make it that long, did I? But what does that show us? The multiplicity of 3 is 4. 3 has multiplicity of 4, which is the same as the power, because that makes this factor repeat 4 times. So you get 3 equals three, you get three four times. And over here, x plus two occurs three times. So we're gonna have x plus two equals zero, x plus two equals zero, x plus two equals zero. Then x minus one equals zero, x minus 1 equals 0, and x plus 3 equals 0. She said panting. So here we have x equals negative 2, x equals negative 2, x equals negative 2, x equals 1, x equals 1, x equals negative three. So let me get rid of these guys. There. All right. Yeah, we'll make this shorter. Um, ha! Don't do that to me. There. 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 There, 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 and there. So now we can do this in a much better way that's a lot more visible. This is multiplicity four. Multiplicity three. Multiplicity two. And multiplicity one. So three has multiplicity four, negative two has multiplicity three, one has multiplicity two, and 
negative three has. Multiplicity one. So, and one more thing, the degree of this polynomial is four plus three plus two plus one, which is 10, right? Mm -hmm. So the degree of this polynomial is 10. And you have four plus three plus two plus one zeros, as you should have with a degree 10 polynomial. It's a joy. Okay, now here are some ultimately cool. This isn't cool. Oh well. We now are going to look at how do you know what the maximum number of zeros is for this function and the maximum number of, <clears throat> that's supposed to be X intercepts, the maximum number of X intercepts, and the maximum number of turning points. A turning point, these are turning points relative maxes and mins, relative maximum points and relative minimum points. Or actually, well, no, they're saying points. So yeah, points. You can t get all of this information immediately just by looking at the leading term because it all depends on the degree of the polynomial. How many zeros? What is the maximum number of zeros? Five. What is the maximum number of x-intercepts? Five. What is the maximum number of turning points? always one less than the number of zeros. Four. Is that too cool? Let's do it again. <clears throat> the highest power is five. the maximum number of zeros the function can have. Five. Wasn't it the same before? Yes. How unexciting. The maximum number of x-intercepts that the graph of the fun function can have. Five the maximum number of turning points that the graph of the function can have. Four. That's all there is to that. Okay. One more thing. If I have a function and it factors into x plus 1 times x minus 2, 
then I know that the zeros will be x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 2. I'm, I'm imagining each factor set equal to 0. And if the zeros are negative 1 and positive 2, then I know that the x-intercepts will be negative 1, 0, and 2, 0. And that the multiplicity of each of these is 1. Okay, I'm going to do a quick, very unbeautiful graph because I specialize in unbeautiful graphs. Negative 1, positive 2. See? There's a method that I can use that makes it less bad. Well, the point I'm trying to make here is that If you have, if a zero has multiplicity one, then when the function is graphed, it cuts straight through the x-axis from one side to the other. graph cuts cleanly through the y-axis, uh, x-axis. Imagine a knife cutting cleanly. Okay, now, suppose we have this factorization. I don't even know if this is possible. But this is going to give us x equals negative 1, but it's going to have multiplicity 2. And this will give us x equals 2 and it will have multiplicity one. Okay. We're gonna see if my creation is even possible. Trust me that there's a reason I'm doing this. Not for my health, but for your health. Ha! 
Ha! Is that great? Is that great? All right, let me let me attempt to draw this. Here's negative one. And positive two. And what we have happening here. Is this. Negative one has multiplicity two. It never crosses the x-axis. It comes up, touches the x-axis, and then goes back down. That's what happens when you have multiplicity two. On the other hand, this, this one just cuts right through the x-axis. This is two, it has multiplicity one. Clean cut through the x-axis. Okay, now. We're going to stick with our same same guys here. I'm going to make let this stay a two, but change that to a, to the third power cubed. So I left that two, okay. Carrot three. Graph. Ha! Yes! Having fun. All right. This Negative one has multiplicity two. Now positive two is going to have multiplicity three. Here's the multiplicity two. And now look what happens at X equals two that has multiplicity three. There's a kind of a flattening that occurs. And then the graph heads on up. This is multiplicity three. And this is multiplicity two. Okay, and finally, I'm going to let that be to the fourth power and X minus two be to the fifth power. That way negative one has multiplicity four and two has multiplicity five.
We're almost done with this. Four. Five. You're not showing it very well. Negative three, let's go to negative three. Okay, really hard to see, but I'll tell you what ought to be happening. Negative one now has multiplicity four. Before when it had multiplicity two, the graph came up and, I know I'm drawing, the graph came up and, and kissed the x-axis there and went back down. So let me try to draw this a little better. It's just a quick little kiss, smooch and then it runs away. There, like a shy little kid. But here, as, as this line crosses the x-axis, notice there's a flattening. Now watch what happens. We've got the same basic shape going on here, but now there's a lingering at, well, if negative two were a, a zero, there would be. There's a lingering at x equals negative one. Kind of a flattening. This is fourth root, uh, multiplicity four. And then here, there's even more of a flattening for multiplicity five. It's not really flat, but it's a flattening. Okay, I just wanted you to see that. Before we go, and it is 10.49. Our official quitting time is 10.50. So we have accomplished everything we set out to do today. I wish you a wonderful spring break, but if you're like me, you're gonna take advantage of spring break as a time for studying and catching up on your work because you're probably behind in a lot of different classes, because that is the lifestyle of college.